Oh, well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everyone. We all know, we've been learning, that there's nothing that we can do to make God stop loving us. And there's nothing we can do to make God love us more. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, rising from the grave, we've been adopted into God's family and we are God's children and our Father loves us. That is the essence of what we believe. It's what I believe and it's what I believe because it's what the Bible teaches me. And it's what I believe because as I believe it, I do better. If you're a parent or if you're an adult and you've ever dealt with kids, have your kids ever had friends that you didn't like? Okay? Rhonda was talking about having to share God's love with people you may not even like. Well, every one of us has had kids or been around kids who had friends they didn't like. And the criteria that I always use is with my children, do I like them when they're with these particular friends? Because the person may be a pleasing enough person to be around, but if all of a sudden my kid starts getting in trouble and it's only when that person's around, I know that there may be something going on there. And so that's like the criteria that I've used all through my life. If I'm doing something and life is good and I'm getting along with God and I'm getting along with my family and my friends, what I'm doing is probably right. If I'm doing something and all of a sudden everyone I know is not liking what I'm doing and disagreeing with what I'm saying, you know, maybe I ought to check into that. And I believe with everything in me that Jesus is exactly who he says he was. And he's the only way to get to the Father. And I'm convinced. Don't try and argue with me about it. Check it out for yourself. That's what we're doing here. That is the gospel. That is the good news. And that is the grace that we are blessed to live in. Today we're talking about forgiveness and consequences. Last week was grace and consequences. Today is forgiveness and consequences. And it's something, again, that we all deal with. We looked at the subject last week because it can be a little confusing. Well, at least it's confusing for me for quite a while. And it makes me ask a question. If we've been forgiven and we're in right standing with God based on our faith in Jesus, why does it matter what we do or how we live? If God looks at us and says, that's my kid, why does it matter how I treat you? Well, what we found out last week the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, that you might say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything's good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. And our lives are much, much better if we do things that are good for us and we do things that are beneficial. Rhonda drug me involuntarily to Walmart Friday. Actually, I don't mind Walmart because while she's looking at stuff she likes, there's stuff I like. It's not like when she drags me to Joanne's Fabrics. <laughs> and we're walking around Walmart and while we were there, we decided to do some grocery shopping and we put stuff in the cart and then we went out and as a lot of the bigger stores are doing nowadays, the number of actual cashiers is getting smaller so most people tend to use the self-checkout area. And I don't mind that. Then I go up and I'm checking my stuff. And then it occurred to me, 
I've never purchased a vegetable at Walmart before. How the heck do I buy a cucumber? And so I had to get the young lady's attention and say, I'm sorry, I know this is dumb, but I don't know how to buy vegetables. And she kind of looked at me, and that smile that I just hate how often I see it, because it's like, what a quaint old person. And I know exactly what it is because that's how I looked at people for so many years. Wait, you mean you can watch a TV show and record it on the VHS at another... What? Quaint old person. First you have to set the clock. Now see, nobody knows what that is anymore because we don't use VCRs. I hope you don't use VCRs. I'm sorry, Charles. <laughs> Charles is going to go home and get the Ghostbusters 2 VHS out of his player. And, <laughs> and it occurred to me, I don't like vegetables. <laughs> but I eat them. Not as often as I should, but I do eat them. You know why? They're good for me. They help me poop. <laughs> they give me like vitamins and chemicals and stuff they say I'm supposed to need. But they're good for me. Our lives are better when we do the stuff that is good for us. When we do the things that are beneficial. It's what Paul was talking about. He also said to the church in Ephesus, do not give the devil a way to defeat you. When we do stuff that isn't good for us, it opens the door for the devil to come in. When we do stuff that's not good for us, we might as well hang a sign on our back that says, Devil, you're welcome here. Now see, I know a lot of people who just don't get why so much bad stuff happens to them. And I'm thinking, seriously? I don't know you that well. How big of a list would you like? You lie, you cheat, you steal, you don't treat people well, and then you complain that no one likes you? Come on. Don't give the devil a way to defeat you. Why do we have consequences? Because we do things that earn those consequences. And one of the most important things we learned last week was that if it weren't for bad consequences, we would never change how we behave. It's the bad consequences that help us learn how to make good decisions. So, sometimes we need to be reminded of that. But this brings us up to another couple of interesting questions. The first one, we got to start here, is what is forgiveness? You know, we use a lot of words and we don't know the definitions to those words. I can remember once when I was standing up here and I defined the word pandemic. All that means is a widespread disease. You know that every year in the United States, we have a common cold pandemic? The problem is we're all used to it. And we don't even notice a lot of times when we have a cold. Especially if you live in Riverside and your body doesn't get along with pollen. Because it's probably not a cold. It's probably allergies. We use words all the time. Our government used the word for a couple of years, quarantine. They misused it. Quarantine means to take somebody sick and put them apart from other people until they get well. They used it to take everyone who was well and lock them up until they decided we could come back outside. That's not a quarantine. Does anybody remember what we did find out that was? 
That was house arrest. I'm not joking. So, what is forgiveness? The next question is, does God's forgiveness mean anything to us in our relationships with each other? We've learned that according to the Bible, many scriptures confirm for us that we have been accepted, that when we accepted the work that Jesus did for us, God forgave our sin. He doesn't hold it against us, and he doesn't separate us from him any longer. In fact, in Ephesians 1, It says, so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. You guys have heard me say this for years now. Look at the tense of the verb. Forgave. Past tense. God has already forgiven our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. When we accept Jesus, we are forgiven by God. In 1 John 1, 9, if you grew up in Sunday school, you memorized this verse by the time you were three or four. If we confess our sins, now remember, we found out that confess means to agree with God's view of them. It doesn't mean we have to go to him with a list and remind him of everything we think think we've done wrong. I found out there's a reason that I get breakfast at McDonald's before church every Sunday. It's so that I always have a current and fresh example of me behaving incorrectly. Pulled up into the drive-thru this morning. There were two cars in each lane. So I kind of pulled to the middle to see if I could figure out which lane was going to move first. The one on the left moved first. So I went over here and got in line. First car pulls up. This side, the car pulls up. The one in front of me, they pull up and they order. The one next to me pulls up and orders. And then the car in front of me pulls up about half a car length. There was 10 or 12 feet between it and the car in front of it. But Mr. Nissan minivan is sitting in front of me and I can't get up to order. And I can hear the girl, are you ready to order, please? What can I get for you today? What can we start for you today? And I'm like, I'm back here. I can't get up there yet. (laughs) Because Bonehead with the coexist bumper sticker won't pull up far enough. And then I watch the person next to me who I should have ordered first. It's the zipper, you know, pulls up. I'm like, and then I think, yeah, see, here's the irony. Where am I going? (laughs) To church. (laughs) Where we get to praise and worship God with our church family. And then I'm supposed to preach. Moron. I don't have to remember that next Saturday night before I go to bed and say, oh, that's right, God. I had bad thoughts last Sunday morning in the drive-thru. Would you please forgive that sin? Because as we just read, God forgave already. If we confess our sins, if we align our opinion about sin with God's, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we accept Jesus and what he did for us, we are forgiven. It's as simple as that. Now, of course, what we learned last week, there will be consequences. But God isn't holding anything against us. But see, then we can read a bunch of verses like this. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. 
So what is forgiveness and what does it mean to us? It's one thing to know God forgave me. It's another thing to know that I'm supposed to forgive you. Well, see, God forgiving me makes sense. I'm not a bad guy. I can understand him forgiving me. There wasn't that much to forgive. I know people who believe that. I've heard people say, well, God didn't have to forgive much with me because I don't do anything wrong. And I'm thinking, you mean other than right now? And of course, these are people that do lots of stuff wrong. But we're supposed to be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So, what does forgiveness look like? Is that the next slide? Nope, this is what forgiveness is. I looked up the definition. I have a tendency to do that. If I want to know what a word means, I look up the definition. If it's a spiritual term, I don't look it up in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. I look it up and see how it's used in the Bible. There are Bible dictionaries. There are plenty of resources. And the internet is actually pretty helpful here. Forgiveness means releasing the other from blame, leaving the event in God's hands, and moving on. Every person in here has been harmed or hurt by another person. Every person in here has been treated unjustly. Every person in here has been lied to, has been cheated, sometimes accidentally, sometimes intentionally. And forgiveness means releasing the person who did it from blame leaving the event in God's hands and moving on. But the definition went on. It says, we are to trust God for justice and forgive the person who offended us. That does not mean we must forget the offense. Usually that's beyond our power. This is what's called a paradox. Because the more I try to forget something, the more time I spend thinking about it because I'm trying to forget. There's nothing you've forgotten that you tried to forget. Yeah. The more you try and forget, the more time you spend thinking about it. And I bet you've noticed that when you're trying to forgive somebody, you get angrier. Why? Because you're spending all your time thinking about what that dirty rotten did. If forgiveness was the same as forgetting, there would be no phrase called forgive and forget. And means they're two different concepts. Well, why do we think that should happen? Because that's what God says he does. But I don't know about you, I haven't been terribly successful at forgetting. I can remember the teachers in junior high that were not quite as nice to me as I wanted to be. I was talking with some people this week and I was remembering junior high Spanish class when we weren't allowed to use our names. We had to use our Spanish names. And I was Miguelito, <laughs> little Mikey. Oh, that had the girls just lining up. <laughs> I can remember that teacher. And when I remember that teacher, I go, and see how tall you are now. 
In junior high, I was little. I was a little guy until my senior year. I can remember the guys that were not nice to me, the guys that made fun of me, the guys that got me back when I made fun of them. It's tough to forget some of that stuff. But that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness means releasing them from blame and trusting God for justice. That doesn't mean it's easy, but it's what we're supposed to do. I also found a great quote by a guy named Lewis Smedes. And he says, when you release the wrongdoer from the wrong, you cut a malignant tumor out of your inner life. You set a prisoner free, but you discovered that the real prisoner was yourself. Have you ever run across somebody who you've been holding a grudge against for years and they don't even remember what they did? You know, the one tied up in all of this was not them. It was you. I told you about a lunch I had with a friend of mine from my college years. And we worked at the same place. And I was not the nicest guy to him. He was a little off and I was not above having a good time at his expense. Often. And we reconnected on Facebook decades later and became pretty good friends again. And he lives in Arizona and he and his wife were out here in California and we met for lunch. And we sat there, had a great time catching up, re-getting to know each other face to face. And then when I knew lunch was winding down, I said, you know, there is one thing I needed to talk to you about. And I said, I was not the nicest guy to you all the time when we worked together. And I know that I did some stuff that was not cool and I apologize, I shouldn't have done it and I ask for your forgiveness. And he looks at me and the pause was uncomfortable. He looks at his wife and he says, Mike, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. He didn't even remember. (laughs) Here, I've been beating myself up for 30 plus years and he didn't even remember. He was not holding a grudge. And I sat there and I giggled and I thought, that's funny, that's how God must react when I go to him with stuff that's keeping me from him. So we gotta go on. Obviously, we're not supposed to hold a grudge. We're not supposed to hold a grudge against someone that did something or a lot of somethings. We're not supposed to hold a grudge when people have done things that damaged us or caused pain to us or someone that we care about. I found out that I'm pretty good at not holding a grudge against people that have done something to me. But if you mess with my wife or my children, we've got a problem. And it's funny because Rondo will go, Mike, it's not a big deal. And I'm like, just let me at him. Mike, I don't care. And see, that's not good. As a child of God, I'm not supposed to do that. Grudges are not okay for God's children. Now, it sounds simple, but it seems like a lot of us don't really understand what forgiveness looks like. Ah, there it is, in our everyday lives. It's a word we all use. It's a word we think we understand, yet we don't know how it works. What does forgiveness look like? We tend to think that forgiveness means we accept that some folks are going to treat us or others badly, and we have to be okay with that. Well, you know, that's just how Uncle Joe is. Well, you know, they had a bad week. Well, you know, They have a temper and they can't always control themselves. Well, 
I knew a guy who had a problem hitting his mother when he lost his temper. And he says, I just can't help it. And I said, that's really funny. Do you ever lose your temper at somebody bigger than you? No, that's stupid. Guess what? The vast, vast, vast majority of us can control our behavior. Several years ago, the animal rights activists were having a big thing about where they would come up to older ladies wearing fur and throw paint on them because it's morally wrong to wear fur, I guess, something like that. And a reporter asked this one group, now, why again are you doing this? Because anyone using animal products simply to dress in is committing an unforgivable sin, and we need to make an example of them. And he said, really? So that's why you go after older ladies who are wearing fur. All those bikers over there are wearing leather. Yeah, let that sink in for a second. We make choices. Forgiveness does not mean accepting people's poor or dangerous choices. Or we think that it's our job to keep track of everything they do. You know, to help God remember how bad they are and how good we are. How do we know who to forgive? What to forgive? How to forgive? Are there any conditions that we have to pay attention to before we forgive? How do we deal with our feelings or our emotions during this process? Well, the benefit of Sunday school for me includes knowing Bible stories. And Bible stories give us a glimpse into how God works and how his people work. And there are three stories we want to look at really quickly today. And I know we don't have a ton of time, but there's a huge character in the Old Testament. You may have heard of King David. King David was one of the greatest kings of the nation of Israel, leading God's people. In Acts 13, in verse 22, it says this, God removed Saul, who was the first king, replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And I read that and I get a little confused because David has a fairly interesting life story. But then I thought, he will do everything I want him to do. That does not mean everything he does is what I want. It just means that this is a guy who when God says do something, he'll do it. Well, King David, during one particular season, was at his castle. We can read this story in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. And the Bible says that the time of year when kings were out at war. King David was supposed to be out with his troops, but he didn't feel like it this time. So he sent them out to do his job and he hung out at home. And it said that he was up on top of his castle and he's looking around and he sees a lady taking a bath. And he sees her and she's pretty attractive. At least he's pretty attracted to her. And so he gets one of his servants and he says, go down and get that woman and bring her to me. And the servant did. Her name was Bathsheba. And he brought Bathsheba to David and... Well, the kids left. 
I was going to say, they had biblical relations. <laughs> he knew her. They had sex. Now, I've heard people say, why didn't she say no? Because he's the king. You don't say no to the king without it costing you your life. They had sex. She got pregnant. David couldn't have this on his conscience and on his record. So her husband, a gentleman named Uriah, was a soldier. And so he sent message out to have Uriah come home and be with his wife. Because at least that way she'd still be pregnant, but nobody would suspect who was the father. Uriah came home feeling incredibly guilty about his men being out in the battle and him being at home, so he would not sleep with his wife. Uriah is already a better man than most of us. David's plan didn't work. Uriah went back to the battlefield. So David talked to the commander and had them change their battle plans and put Uriah at the front line during an attack that was not going to work. And Uriah was killed. Then David said, yay, now I can have her all to myself and no one will complain. I've just taken an entire chapter and squished it down to this. You ought to read it, it's very interesting. In 2 Samuel, the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb that he had bought. He raised that little lamb. It grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate, drank from his cup. Oh, how cute. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. Instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb, killed it, and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one that he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. This is not a reporter at a press conference trying to ask a question. This is a guy talking face to face to the king. The prophet says, you are that man. The Lord God of Israel says this, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and his kingdoms of Israel and Judah. If that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then? Have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? You have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites. You've stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. It doesn't say God did that. It's a consequence. It's a far-reaching consequence. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, your own household will rebel against you. Your wives will be given to other men before your very eyes. And they will go to bed with them in public view. You did this secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. This is just... The prophet talking to the king. Now, 
nope, that verse isn't supposed to be up anymore. Now you've seen how even lower level public leaders react to being corrected. You've seen what happens when a governor who's mandated that his state be shut down is videotaped having a non-mask, non-social distancing dinner with a bunch of friends. They don't react well to that. You've seen what happens when people say, but if those are the rules you're giving us, how come you're not following them? You've seen how celebrities react when they go to these big public events and the only people wearing masks are the servants. You've seen how this works in our world. Imagine if you're dealing with the king. If David were a politician today, he'd say, I'm different. I don't have to follow the rules that I make everyone else follow. I couldn't help myself. She shouldn't have been bathing in public. She wasn't in public. She was on her roof, which was protected. The only reason he could see it is his roof was higher. It's not my fault. That wasn't what the army was supposed to do. There are all kinds of ways David could have reacted. What he says is, David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. When you finish reading through this whole section, things don't end well for David. But he never tried to avoid the consequences of his actions. He simply wanted things to be right with him and God. He was looking for forgiveness, not a change of consequences. It's interesting. David admitted his guilt and went on. The next story is one that many of us are aware of. We've looked at it several times here. Jesus tells it. In Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11, it says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Let me put that in starker language. My life would be better if you were dead. because then I would get the stuff that I'm supposed to get when you die. I would prefer that you were dead. But since you're not dead, will you at least give me my stuff? Just enough to bless a dad's heart. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time the money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and that man sent him into his fields to tend the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. You ever seen pig food? I I think the accurate term is called slop. I've heard pigs called nature's garbage disposal. They'll eat anything. And so they get fed whatever's left over. This guy's looking at the food he's feeding the pigs and thinking, man, I'd like some of that. No one gave him anything. 
When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Will you please take me on as a hired servant? So he returned home to his father. Again, it's interesting to me that the son seeking forgiveness was not trying to escape the consequences of his very hurtful actions against his father. He acknowledged his sin and wanted to go on. The last story we're going to look at today, and there are many others. This involved Jesus during his crucifixion. But of course, Jesus isn't the one seeking forgiveness. In Luke 30, 22, or no, excuse me, 23, 35, it says, the crowd watched and the leader scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. Jesus is being crucified. And there's a party going on because of it. People are having quite a bit of cruel fun at his expense. The religious leaders are publicly mocking him because he's not doing anything to save his life. If he's really who he says he is, wouldn't he be calling down angels? Wouldn't he be commanding things? The soldiers mocked him too by offering a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And so they made a sign and hugging above him that said, this is the king of the Jews. I'm not keeping up with my slides very well today. I apologize. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. All my life, I've heard stories about people who meet God when they're in prison. I don't discount any stories like that. But I'm always a little suspicious when I hear people say, I met God in prison. I'm a different man now. So I shouldn't be held to the consequences of what the old guy did. I know I murdered that family, but I met Jesus. And if he forgives me, shouldn't you? That's never sat well with me. Partially because I've read stories a lot like a gentleman that I admire greatly. His name is Chuck Colson. He's the only person who went to prison for the Watergate scandal in the early 70s. And when he was in prison, he met Jesus and never once asked for his sentence to be reduced. What he said was, as long as I'm here, I'm going to minister to people. In his entire prison sentence, he spent ministering to people. And when he got out of prison, you know what he did? Spent the rest of his life ministering to people. <coughs> Excuse me. He didn't try and avoid the consequences of his actions. He let God use those consequences and reached millions upon millions of prisoners worldwide for Jesus. This thief says, if you're really the Messiah, save yourself. And while you're at it, save us. In Luke 23, 40, the other criminal protested. 
Don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? You're going to die today. How about you quit being a jerk? We deserve to die for our crimes. This man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What he just did was express his faith and trust in Jesus. Even though he didn't understand what was happening. He just said, Jesus, remember me. He didn't say, Jesus, get me out of here. Jesus, make me reappear somewhere else. Jesus, make me unable to be killed. He just said, Jesus, when you get to your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. And of course, because I am who I am, I wonder what was the other guy thinking during all this? No, he was probably going, getting ready to die and you're still a sucker. See, forgiveness does not mean getting out of consequences. Forgiveness with God is different than forgiveness with people down here. I would love to go to an Aston Martin dealer. And I'd even take a used DB12. And I'd sign the contract. And then the next day say, oh, well, I've had an encounter with God. That's not me anymore. Well, we want our car back. What car? (laughs) And as ridiculous as that is, that's how a lot of people are. They get offended when consequences happen. Where is God now? You mean the God that warned us not to make those choices in the first place? The God who very mercifully told us what the consequences could be. He's letting us learn. The thief on the cross admitted that he deserved to die for his crimes. He didn't even ask Jesus to help him get his sentence reduced. He simply asked Jesus to remember him. He asked Jesus for forgiveness. Could it be that those seeking forgiveness, authentic forgiveness, accept that the consequences of their choices are not part of what's being dealt with? Forgiveness and consequences are two different concepts. Do we want forgiveness or to be excused? What do we say when we bump into somebody? Excuse me. Pardon me. When we do something that's not socially acceptable. It, it's embarrassing to be around Rhonda if she's had a soda. <laughs> because she's like, hi. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> I never <laughs> accidentally Emphasis on the word accidentally. I worked for years to develop that skill. A couple times I've done it, but I could consistently almost get through the entire alphabet in one belch. I could easily do to the letter V. Because I'm a guy, I work on stuff like that. When we do stuff accidentally, what do we say? Oh, pardon me. Excuse me. Please don't hold that against me. Don't make me suffer any consequences for that. It was an accident. Forgiveness and excused are two different things. I've noticed that God never makes excuses for people. 
He's not in the throne room sitting with Jesus looking at me and saying, well, he's Dave and Linda's kid. What do you expect? (laughs) That's not what he does. Because he's not excusing me. He's forgiven me. What are we looking for? Forgiveness or excuses? Remember what Paul told us in Galatians chapter 6. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. That doesn't mean we're not forgiven. According to the definition we just read, forgiveness means we need to trust God to make everything just and fair. We've talked about this verse often before. But God takes everything we give him and makes it better. Have you been mistreated? Give it to God. He'll make it better. I've been mistreated. If I give it to God, he'll make it better. He makes all things work together for good. God is the one who makes everything just and fair. That's not our place. We can't do it. If you've ever had more than one child, you know that you cannot be just and fair. There is no way. I went to engineering school at Cal Poly. I am not capable of cutting the piece of cake in half to where each child is pleased with what they get. So I had somebody tell me when my kids were little, oh, that's easy. Let one kid cut the cake and the other one choose which piece they get. It is amazing how accurately they can divide that piece of cake. (laughs) I can't be just and fair to the desire of the people that I'm dealing with. But that's God's job. If somebody has hurt me, the truth is, Becky, I'm never going to be satisfied. I've had people hurt me and pay for it and apologize. And then when something bad happens to them, I'm like, Yeah, see? Because in my head, there is no just result from this. Why? Because I'm still living when they did something bad to me, and that's where I'm keeping my brain. I don't care if it's been 35 years that Margie and I have been great friends because in 1986, she said, you all know people like that. I guarantee you they're not happy people. I might even predict that they're probably not healthy people. It is not our job to make sure everything is just and fair. Just from what those stories tell us, and there are lots of other stories. We might notice that God's mercy and guidance sometimes make things turn out better than we deserve. But we've still got to give it to him. I've done things wrong. And if I'm paying attention, I got to apologize. And if there's anything I can do to help make it better, I've got to do that. But I don't have to be manipulated by people. And I don't have to hold grudges to make sure somebody pays. And folks, that's a biggie right now. I'm angry at you, not because of what you did, but because what somebody who might look like you did 200 years ago. I was talking with a friend recently and they said, yeah, well, 
this other person, they've been hurt by the church. And I thought, they've been hurt by the church? Or were they hurt by a church? There's a difference. Or maybe they were hurt by a person at a church. That's a difference. But what we're dealing with is people that are holding grudges. And here we'll end with circular logic. Holding a grudge is its own misbehavior that has consequences. <laughs> so we got to pursue forgiveness. We got to forgive each other. We don't have to be manipulated. When someone's trying to get forgiveness to get out of the consequences of their actions, don't be involved. Don't fall for it but don't hold a grudge. Because just like God has forgiven us, we're supposed to forgive each other. Forgiveness is better. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you that even though all of us have done things that you have forgiven, we are learning. We are working on and we are following you to understand how to express that forgiveness to the people around us. I know each of us have been hurt. And I know that there are things that have been done to some of us that we won't forget. But that's okay. We give it to you. We don't try and make people pay. We don't try and hold grudges. We don't enjoy when something bad happens to somebody else. We simply give it to you. Because you have forgiven us. We want to forgive each other. So Father, whatever you have for us to do this week, we thank you that you're holding us in your hands. You'll give us clear direction and you'll bring us back safely next week. I pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen.